Hi there, this is legendary comedian and podcast pioneer Jimmy Pardo. I'm here to tell you about the award-winning podcast, Never Not Funny. We are now celebrating our 18th anniversary. That's right, 18 years of podcast greatness. Never Not Funny was one of the first comedy podcasts, and I'm told it's still one of the best. With guests like John Hamm, Caitlin Olson, Sarah Silverman, Maria Bamford, and Conan O'Brien, you get to listen in on some of the funniest people on the planet, tell stories, and make each other laugh. Subscribe to Never Not Funny now in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I talk about my personal life and a little bit of gossip. So I am trying to remain positive. I'm up here in San Ramon and um, there's been some developments in my IVF journey. So obviously I'm going to share them with you. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'm trying to, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm a little bit down and not as optimistic as I was about my IVF journey a week ago. When I was starting my injections of Menopure and Gonal F and Cetratide and very, very excited. So you all know I'm 42, just just had a birthday, 42, and I have gone back and forth about even trying a round of IVF because your chances of having doing one round of IVF and having it be successful over 40 are much smaller than if you are under 40. And I was told by um, an IVF doctor... I should just move on to an egg donor. And then I had a second and a third opinion. And they said, your AMH level is 1.31, which is pretty good for your age. Um, your FSH is like 10, I think, or 15. I can't remember. One of those numbers, and they, which they also thought was very good given my age. And so they said, you know, you'd be a likely candidate. And by the way, I believe I will get one to two good eggs. I do. I'm putting it out there in the universe. God has the best plan. I'm declaring I will get a good egg from this procedure. Um, but I started my shots probably about 10 days ago. Ish. And um, everything was looking great. Last Tuesday... Uh, a week ago, I had a baseline sonogram in LA by my OBGYN, which was the plan. Um, okay, I thought a baseline sonogram basically meant they just measured your follicles, take a, you know, make sure the uterus is looking good, send it back. It was pretty standard. Well, somehow along the way, there was some level of confusion, whether they, I guess, you know, they usually measure the follicles in milliliters. My OBGYN's team measured them in centimeters. Um, And whatever they were seeing, it looked like they were seeing 15 follicles, which is a lot, right? So we were like super excited. The way they measured them, it seemed like they were measuring much larger. And so I got a call from the IVF clinic here in San Ramon, and they said, you should really get up here sooner than Friday. That was sort of the plan because they're growing quite large. We're thinking that your retrieval is going to be on Sunday. We want to see you Thursday in the office. Okay. We get up at three in the morning on Thursday. We drive up. The shots have been pretty easy. I've talked to a lot of women about IVF. The shots have been relatively easy. Um, super easy to mix. Like the first night, you know, you just, it takes a a while. Thank God I have an ICU nurse that like lives next door. So she came over and and helped me. Um, and then once I was in the hang of it, it's fine. You know, you just rotate sides. I haven't had that much bruising. If anything, if you lifted up my shirt, you would see pinholes (laughs) in my stomach. Um, not my stomach, but my lower abdomen. Um, that look like needles, obviously punctures. So, but aside from that, I've had minimal bruising. Shots are super easy. The needle, needles are really tiny. Um, the cetratide and menopur burn a little here and there, but nothing you can't manage. Didn't need to ice. A lot of the women were like, ice, ice. Eh, screw it. Too lazy. Threw the alcohol swab, swab on it. Boom. All right. So the shots have been going easy. I'm like, great. Responding so well. Things are good. Get up here on Thursday and they're like, yeah, well, Obviously, they, you know, the OBGYN's office or the clinic here, somebody kind of misinterpreted the readings, and it looks like now you have more like seven to nine follicles. And they're growing slower than we thought, which is typical. 
of, you know, somebody your age. Okay, so that was like the first knock, you know, but they were, you know, they're positive, they're optimistic, they're like, they're doing what they're supposed to do, this is still good. Okay, sounds great. So, but the retrieval was not going to happen on Sunday, instead it's happening today. So, then uh, over the weekend on Sunday, or sorry, Saturday, I get a phone call, and I have all these drugs, by the way, you know, I have Cetratide, I have... um. So Mactin, which is a form of HCG in the refrigerator. I have my trigger shot, all these things. And I get a call on Saturday and the woman's like, okay, look, looking good, looking like we're growing these good five to seven follicles and um, looks like five are really good and you're going to be doing your trigger shot tomorrow, Sunday. It looks like your retrieval is Tuesday. Great. Um, and I said, you know, by the way, I have this Zomactin, the, this HCG. When do I start that? You know, because the, re- the retrieval is coming up. And she's like, oh, my God, you, you have Zomactin? She's like, well, they should have told you to start taking that on your pre-op day, which would have been Friday. And I said, no, nobody, nobody told me. And she's like, oh, my God, it's such an expensive drug. Um, let me check with the doctor. Maybe you could take a couple of... Um, doses of it I don't know if it's going to make any difference at this point there's mixed science about it and it's HCG and it should have started you know a while ago anyway I get a call from the doctor and they're like no it doesn't make a big difference at this point don't take it just hold on to it in case you're doing another round of IVF and it's like no I'm not doing another round of IVF this was it so you know I've had to have some moments and I, I mean I guess I'm curious a lot of you guys that went through IVF. I mean, (laughs) are these mistakes typical or is this California or is this like me? I I can't figure it out. I'm just like, why does the ineptitude with these IVF doctors here in California seem to like continue regardless of, I thought it was just Los Angeles, Los Angeles. Now I've come up to San Ramon. I mean, you know, this was like a, this was an emailed message from the doctor. Yes, we're going to include HCG in my portal. So how are we, like, how are you not refunding me? How are we not? I mean, I'm going to still ask about that because I I think that's crazy. So that drug out the window. Um, So anyhow, as you're listening to this, I am having my retrieval and, um, I can't wait to let you know how it goes. I am, I'm just saying my prayers. So many of you guys have sent me amazing prayers and good wishes and good vibes. And I know God's taking care of everything. And like I said, I'm claiming it on God. I am getting my healthy baby from this process. So here we go. Um, But (laughs) I guess did you get, did any of these, did any of your cycles start or things get messed up and what happened? I'd love to hear about them. All right. So I started out this podcast, told you about the mix-ups, and I was getting ready to be optimistic. And right after I went to post this podcast episode yesterday, I got a phone call from my IVF doctor saying, um, I want I want to be straight with you. Um, we started out with 15 follicles. We started out with 15 promising follicles and we missed this drug, this HCG drug that we should have thrown in there post 40. And I want to be honest with you, you're down to four decent sized follicles and will these work? Podcast. Is it a podcast? What do you want to say? Cars. Two. Just do Cars two Jackson Cars three Cars, Jackson Storm. Cars right. three That's Jackson all Storm. All right, well that made me feel better. No free ads. Okay, no free ads. <laughs> okay, that actually cheered me up. Um, so she said you're down to four four decent follicles, and the kind of the theory is one out of four are good, and if we get one good one, that would be we would be very lucky. And can you beat the odds? Yes, but I think you and I thought we had a much higher chance going into this. This is why the doctor said I think you'd be a good candidate. So basically, she said, look, if you had insurance coverage, 
that covered your IVF and your drugs, I'd 100% be canceling this. And I would tell you, we're, we're going to work the insurance company and you need another round of drugs and we're going to adjust the protocol and we're not going to go. I, I can't, I don't remember if she said they you, they went too hard with the gonalef and the Menopure or not hard enough. So we're going to be doing something different, a different protocol. I think it's like almost like a micro, uh, like a micro IVF cycle. I think, I think they think they went too hard. That they burnt them out, the eggs, they, they, they wouldn't grow. And so they just almost like reacted negatively. I believe. Don't quote me. Clearly, I'm not a doctor. Um, so she said, I will do what you want. We can we can do it. But essentially, your 18000 kicks in starting tomorrow. The minute you come in here to do your retrieval, that is when the bulk of your money. And she said, I just, I, first of all, I could sense in her voice, she was like, whatever you want to do. But I just feel like she was saying to me, I don't think this has a really good chance of working. I think that you should give this another try. try. So she said, look, I will, let me talk to my team. We'll figure out something to get you some discounts. We can figure out some coupons, some things to get you a discount on the ne- next round of drugs. And I think that you, we, we should reorder some things. And I have, I have a bunch of IVF drugs left over because my follicles were growing slower than what they thought. And so I had to reorder and then I didn't use some of it. So, so I have, you know, a fair amount of drugs to start. So she so we canceled. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? Oh my God. Cars 3. Give me a Cars 3 shout out. Um, I'm in disbelief. You know, I was listening to my girl, Natasha Alisa. She has a brand new podcast out called She Read It Herself. And, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful modern Christianity podcast. And she did an episode last week about turning it over to God and just listening to God. And she said, you know, I want you to listen to this episode because I was thinking of you the entire time I did this episode and I listened and it was so good. And if you don't know who Natasha Alisa is, she's amazing. She's, uh, most famously Kane from the radio. Everybody knows I worked with him for years, uh, his ex-wife and oh my God, this woman has been through the ringer and prevailed. I mean, went up against Kane, who was just like, oh, it was the most awful divorce. She lost her girls for a period of time. He he won like full custody. She had to go to rehab. But it was crazy. And she has prevailed. Now she has her daughters. You know, unfortunately, Kane passed away. But his narcissistic sociopath, all that stuff, she's free of. I mean, I always say to her, like, God looks out for you like no one else. And she's like, AJ, hi. we're all in this hotel room in San Ramon. Oh, we should have gotten an Airbnb. Guys, I don't know. I, 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 I'm I, so at a loss for words. When do you know that God wants you on a different path? And when do you keep going? My shmano says to me, Sarah, almost everyone who does IVF, very few people do one round of IVF and have success. The first round is always an experiment, which is true because they have to get to know your body. They got to get to know your protocol. And, you know, that that we are not unique in that. And, but I'm like, God, we've been at this since we were, I was 37. 37 was the first time I was pregnant with that crazy molar pregnancy that set us back nine months. Then the next month we got pregnant. We had our healthy KJ. Now we've been trying for a year and a half. Two miscarriages. I don't know. Is that like a lot or not that much? Ah, This is a first for the Sarah Fraser show. I have partnered with a mindful eating doctor. You guys know I gained and lost 150 pounds until I found mindfulness and quit all fad dietings. If you have tried every diet under the sun, I want to introduce you to Dr. Applin at Optimal Body. 
Go to MyOptimalBody.com, request an appointment, and be sure to say that the Sarah Fraser Show sent you because you can qualify for a free personalized assessment plus a bonus free 30-day supply of their gut repair product when you sign up for a customized plan. Again, that's MyOptimalBody.com to request an appointment. I have never partnered with a fad weight loss company, and I never will. Dr. Applin is the real deal. If you have even tried Ozempic and it didn't work for you, you need to see him. Starts with a gut reset and they actually make a plan for you that is long-term and slow weight loss so you can keep it off and change your life forever. Don't believe me? Go and read their mindful five-star reviews. Go to MyOptimalBody.com and tell them the Sarah Fraser Show sent you. Don't you love discovering new games for your phone that are a bit of a mind teaser, a little bit of a mystery, and aren't filled with annoying ads? Boom, I got it for you. Seekers Notes. Guys, Seekers Notes is in a game already played by 40 million fans. And the best part about this game, there it isn't one of those games just for killing time. It's a perfect stress reliever, too. The game is great with community and social interactions. Every puzzle is a workout for your brain, baby. Also, the best part, like I mentioned, totally a no annoying ads. It's no Wi-Fi needed, and it's free. Now, it has a variety of virtual collectibles as well. Beyond the captivating visuals and immersive atmosphere, Seeker's Note offers a treasure trove of virtual collectibles. These are not mere items. They are relics and add depth and meaning to your journey. What are you waiting for? Get playing today. Get a little stress reliever. Oh, nothing is better than a fun game on your phone. Download Seeker's Notes now. You know, I just am like, do I just... Why am I doing this? Should I just ask for a full refund and then go to the egg donor? Do that. I can select the gender of my child, use someone else's egg. And I I did IVF because people who have done egg donor, everyone who has done egg donor has said to me, you should try to use your own eggs because you're always going to wonder, well, was this the try? (laughs) So we're taking a car ride back from San Ramon to Los Angeles today. Uh, it's about six hours. So Schman and I are going to do our pros and cons list and map it out. But there's that. Leave me your advice. Leave me your advice. You guys haven't steered me wrong so far. You've given me great advice. Also, when you did IVF, do your like boobs hurt and itch really badly? I'm like, are these drugs safe? Oh, I'm getting tired of all these goddamn drugs. I know they save lives, right? They save lives. The vaccine. I'm so angry. This is going to turn into a vaccine rant. <laughs> okay. The vaccine. Is this a, is this fine to load yourself up with these hormones? Is this like normal? Another round in three weeks. So basically, have another period. Shed these eggs. I have to take um, progesterone right now before I go to bed. So... I can ease because I'm, I'm getting ready to ovulate. Normally you ovulate one or two eggs a month. Well, I'm getting ready to drop four, actually five, but one is so large. They were going to just sacrifice that guy and focus on the other four. I felt so good about this too, coming into it. I was like, yes, San Ramon, here we come, baby. And when I got my baseline reading a week ago, I had 15 follicles. I'm like, oh snap we're gonna grow even more we're gonna be at 20 yes sweetie we're, we're down to four stragglers and they ain't liking the drugs anyhow did your body reject the ivf drugs how'd you know that okay also on this podcast episode um i talk about wendy williams documentary very fascinating if you haven't watched although the internet basically everyone hates it and i I can't, it, it's so sad, so tragic. But the other story I talk about, which there's also an update, is Angela and Michael from 90 Day Fiance. It was so bizarre yesterday. He was reportedly missing. Well, now he's been found. He apparently called the police himself. Um, said he, I guess he doesn't want Angela to know his location. Um, but he is, okay. What the hell? I mean, what is going on with these 90-day people? Honestly, what is going on with them? There's been so many, 
twists and turns and alleged scammers out there from 90 Day. Well, now there's an update. And hold on. (sighs) Because my internet, of course, is taking a turd while we do this. All right, Michael was 30 years old when he sent flirty messages to Angela, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what is the latest update? Um, The police are involved. If he left on his own, he should have called me, walked out. Angela suspects Michael may have planned this since the start. If Michael is really missing and doesn't contact, contact us, immigration can take over. That's all I can tell you, Angela said. Um... Okay, well, he apparently has been found. So he's been located. Nobody knows if this is real or a scam. Really, that's the only update. So I was right. The I thought that they'd have some sort of, this is like breaking news. I thought they'd have some sort of more details. They probably will over the next 24 hours. But just apparently he's made a call to police. So, um, and Angela even referenced this is not a Karini and Paul situation, referring to Paul allegedly going missing, if you recall, September of last year. And, of course, he was alive and well the entire time. So that'll unfold. All right. Yeah. Um, always you can find me on Instagram at The Sarah Fraser Show and TikTok at The Sarah Fraser Show or on our Reddit. Same deal. I also spent the weekend watching the Wendy Williams documentary, where is Wendy? Has anyone been covering watching this? This documentary, four parts. I don't know anyone. I don't think I've seen one positive review about this Lifetime documentary. In fact, I've seen the opposite of people just saying, like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Shame on um, shame on Lifetime. Um, even Wendy Williams guardian, who we'll talk about because that's been revealed, filed an injunction, like a last minute injunction last week to have the documentary pulled. Um, because a lot, that's been the biggest thing is people saying like, why did she do this? Why did she do this? Why is this out there? Because Wendy is an executive producer on this show and I am, I'm obsessed with Wendy. I, you guys know, and I feel like I am living my form of being a talk show host, but even my bigger goal is like have the studio, just design it myself, do my own talk show. Um, So I've loved Wendy forever. She is up there in my top five of all time. You know, Phil Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, R- Rosie O'Donnell, um, you know, Lady O, Oprah Winfrey, by far my favorite talk show host of all time. And then... um. Wendy Williams is right up there with she's probably the last talk show that I really religiously would watch. You know, we'd watch it. We'd be on the radio show. We'd tune in 10 a.m. We'd watch Wendy. So Wendy is an executive producer on this because what you find out is this four part documentary initially was supposed to kick back off her reinvention after she was let go from the talk show space. This was supposed to launch her podcast she was gonna have a fire take everybody down which is true I mean she would have had the number one she would have been up there with Joe Rogan it basically would have been probably Joe Wendy call her daddy like everyone would have been obsessed and this was supposed to relaunch now episode a lot of people from the start have problems with this documentary because they say well it's very obvious in episode one that she's having problems I kind of disagree with that. Episode one, I thought, I didn't, yes, you begin to see cracks, right? Because she's not making sense with all of her interviews. They use a Barbara Corcoran interview where she's like, you know what? I want to whisper in your ear. I've got cats. I've got cats. And Barbara's like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, like, what the fuck? So, But it wasn't, I didn't think the episode one was terrible. And I guess it's set in the scene, right? It's set in the scene because this whole thing is trying to launch her comeback and then really spirals into the people around her, this guardianship. And spoiler alert, she's a roaring alcoholic. That's really what this, this really comes down to. She's a complete and total 
alcoholic that has functioned for a decade on television, parts being sober, parts not, and it really spiraled out of the out of control with the pandemic. Her husband leaving her for a younger woman, having a baby with this woman, that devastated her and the passing of her mom. And you really see she's just been a lifelong addict. She's had these period of times where she's been sober, but now this form of dementia that she has, her son, Kevin Jr., has come out and said it's, it's doctors have said this is really prompted by her alcoholism. And you see that then, then of course, the last couple of episodes just totally spiral. I mean, she's drinking a fifth of vodka every day. And she does say in the first couple of episodes, you know, she loves vodka. Her sister Wanda wants her to stop drinking. It, it's, it's, I, okay, more than people think this is exploitative. I think to me, the actually more, most exploitative part is the loneliness of like, she is so alone. You know, they just scene after scene, she's in this beautiful New York City apartment and she's alone in her bed and she's drunk and they just roll the camera on her. And it's like, oh, my God. I mean, I I don't know. You know, it's it's so heartbreaking. Like her son's away at college and, you know, he's trying to forge and have a life. But it's almost like, oh, my God, like I, I know she she spent her entire life in the limelight and she says she has wanted to be the center of attention since she was six years old. But you always just want to shake people and you're like, just move down to Florida where your son is and like embrace his life and just ha- have a little radio show. And, you know, oh, it, it is. I do agree with the overall internet, internet, though. What is the point? What is the point of this? And it, what it appears the point almost is is a little bit of the family, I think, ruffling some feathers, bringing some awareness to the fact that they have been cut out and she was assigned a guardian by the state of New York after the alarm was sounded from psychologists and medical professionals and her addiction relapse to Wells Fargo that her money was in jeopardy. And part of that, what tripped that off, is Kevin Jr., her son, charging $100,000 on one of her Amex cards. And that red flagged for people that, is he responsible? You know, look, do you ever know, unless you really hang out with people and know them and are around them and are in their house, you really don't know what Wendy is like. Now, a former lawyer of Wendy's has come out and said he debated about even speaking about this, but he says it's important for him to speak up and that Wendy and her son have this incredibly close bond. And he essentially gives his endorsement that Wendy's son should be uh, the one that is her guardian or her sister, which is so, it's, it's really scary. And I heard Charlemagne the God on The Breakfast Club talk about this because he worked with Wendy for three years. And he said, look, you know, people are realizing about Wendy what all of us in the insider world and radio and TV have known about her for a long, long time. And that broke my heart too, right? We see somebody on TV, we think we know them every day. And for many years, they hold, they hold it together when in fact, behind the scenes, things were always a mess. Her husband, Kevin, has always been known as just an asshole that I don't even know that he necessarily looked out for her best interests, but maybe they had an agreement. But he's always been notoriously difficult, Um, you know, rumors of alleged threats to people if they said anything against Wendy or him or very notoriously very, very difficult. So Wendy is given... Sabrina Morrissey, a lawyer specializing in guardianships, the temporary guardian of Wendy Williams Hunter. Morrissey, since this has come out, hasn't said a dingle dangle thing. You know, she did petition the courts on behalf of Wendy on Friday to get it to stop, which was not going to happen. Wendy's come out, says she wants space and time with this dementia diagnosis. Um, And... You know, the the revelations are shocking. We just, we see her drunk at a restaurant burping on camera. Initially on episode one, you see her together. By the end, she's sitting down with Black China. She's almost incoherent when Black China is saying, you know, I love you. You you were there for me at my darkest hour. It's almost like Wendy doesn't even know China. 
um, and then kind of goes off and speaks. Um, she mistakes her. She's sitting with her brother at a lunch and, you know, mistakes him for her former husband, Kevin. It, it's, I get, you know, that's why everyone's fury is what is the point of this? Is this a cautionary tale? Yes. And then it seems like more than that, it's maybe the family sounding the alarm to try to get back custodial guardianship of her. And to me, I would think, I don't know. I don't, th- that is so wild to me how that happened and that the a bank, the government has that right. And I wonder if in her will, or maybe there is no will, Kevin was never appointed like her legal guardian in case she's to become incapacitated. It's just... It's so shocking. She gave us so much. She was such an outlier. And it breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart for her son. Her son's got to be so mixed up in all this. Um, And I think, you know, you just, it's a cautionary tale. If it can happen to Wendy, it can happen to any one of us. And I think addiction is such a, I always say addiction is the lowest state of misery. It's it's just so, because it ruins everything in your life, everything around you. I mean, she would never have been fired if she were sober. She would have stayed on TV as long as she wanted. The ratings were amazing. They never would have brought in guest hosts. But addiction is so difficult. So difficult. Wendy plays it off in the documentary like she doesn't give a shit about the ex-husband or the baby, but everybody around her is like, Oh, yes, you know, 100%. And then people are wondering, is Will, her longtime manager, helpful or hurtful to her? And I think that is one of the talking points, the fascinating things, because I've heard certainly different opinions. Um, Is Will helpful to her or harmful to her, the three people around her? Because it seems like to a level they enable her. You know, they certainly say they, they put up with a lot. They've, they've kept her alive. They've dealt with her crap. But it definitely seems as though they, you know, you, that's one of the, that's one of the questions you have of this documentary. Who's good? Who's not? So in that regard, I'm glad they put it out. But it's hard to see one of your incredible heroes go down like this after all these years. So we'll see what happens Moving forward, her son, Kevin Jr., has come out and said if she can stay sober, there's a huge opportunity for her, which is true. She could relaunch that podcast any day. She'd get enormous guests. I'm sure she has many sources. She would be back on top. But does she want it? Does she want to be sober? Does she want to recreate her life at 59? And I certainly hope that I certainly hope that her son gets control of her because he seems to love her so much. And, I mean, she earned the money. Shouldn't he? Whatever he wants to do with it, shouldn't, um, you know, he get more of the say of it? But she does not look well. She doesn't look well. Clearly, she's an alcoholic. And it's it's just breaks your heart. She was such a star. Other topics going on. This was breaking news yesterday. You know I love my 90-day gossip, my sister wives gossip, my TLC talk, which is new episode tomorrow. Um, well, very bizarre, very another very bizarre story. Angela Deem and Michael. You know Angela and Michael. And Michael's from Nigeria, 90-day fiance. They were just on last resort, and they're supposed to be on the upcoming season of Happily Ever After. March 17th, which is turning out to be a cluster F because Mahmoud and Nicole, Mahmoud was just arrested in Los Angeles, like in my neighborhood, for domestic violence against Nicole. So the, I have to imagine there's some serious internal discussions going on at TLC with all this stuff. But now Michael is reportedly missing. Yesterday on on Johnny Yates, who's a YouTuber, on his YouTube, on Angela's stories, she went live and she says that Michael has been missing for several days here in the United States in Georgia. 
Uh, he's been missing since Friday. He took nothing except the clothes on his back. And people are thinking that he's running from Angela's abuse. Nobody knows his location, according to Angela, and the police are involved. Huh? What? We don't know where he is. People have, oh my God, people are going nuts on this online. Isn't there a way to track him? Cell phone towers. He left his cell phone. They have no, they claim he walked out the door and he is deuces. And we, he is somewhere here in the United States. I get, you can't get, I mean, I, she makes it sound like he left his wallet, everything. I mean, he could have a ID with him. Maybe he's flown back to Nigeria. He's been here for several months in the United States after a lot of back and forth. Angela's 58 years old and she revealed on her TikTok, Michael left everything here. I know that there's people probably that think, oh, maybe he just left, but like nothing, not any ID, nothing to show his name on it, no clothing, not a toothbrush, 0.00, no wallet, nothing, clothes on his back and he left that he left with on Friday. Um, he apparently came to the United States during Christmas time. He's been filming with TLC and he is lost. So I will give you updates. I mean, this is very, very alarming. Michael seemed like more the stable one in this relationship. So a lot of people are very concerned about, you know, is something nefarious happening here? Is he just trying to get away from Angela? Is there more underlying going on but I have to imagine the talks on TLC are nonstop today as we head into happily ever after because tomorrow on my show I talk about you know could not mood and I'm going to get more info and insight on this because TLC has done this in the past or could not mood and Nicole be edited out completely of happily ever after with these domestic violence you know this domestic violence arrest Angela and Michael it's different I mean we'll see how this unfolds we shall see. Also, um, so to everybody in the DC region, I just want to shout out Dr. Will Neem at Horizon Fibroids. You guys know he is the top fibroid doctor. If you're in DC, Maryland, Virginia, horizonfibroids.com. Make your appointment today. Tell him the Sarah Fraser show sent you. You can also see on their website, they accept almost all insurance, but fibroids, oh my gosh, heavy periods, long periods, bloated. You actually can lose a ton of weight when you get uterine fibroid embolization and remove your fibroids. They can cause that much havoc. So definitely call my guy, Dr. Will Name. All right, you guys. Love you so much. Thank you for all just, oh my God, the encouragement, the advice with IVF. And like I said, I'm, I'm remaining positive. I'm much more positive today than I was um, over these past couple of days. It's been very hard. It was even hard to just get out to the Muir forest and immerse myself and let go of everything and just know that God has the greatest plan because, um, yeah, you don't anticipate these things bumping up and going wrong, but they assure me that Zamactin, the HCG, you know, is still very experimental and, you know, good outcomes are happening. So I will keep you posted. We will know very soon. All right. Love you guys. Bye, everybody.